My name is Makoto Kikuchi, and I have a pleasure and indeed a honor to be uh, to chairing of these sessions. Uh, I, since I suppose most of you may possibly know David <laughs> better than I do, so I think I don't need to spend so many times to introduce him, but uh, I would like to do uh, very briefly. Uh, David, uh, Dr. David H. Sliney holds a PhD in biophysics and medical physics from the University of London as uh, an MNS, Master of Science in Physics and Radiological Health from uh, Emory University and Bachelor of Science in Physics in, from Virginia Polytech Institute. He worked, as you know, for 40 years at the U.S. Army Center of Health Pro Promotion and Prevention, Preventive Medicine. In 1995, he became program managers, later optical radiation programs. He has been active in the establishment of health and safety standards for protection of the eye and skin from lasers and high in intensity optical sources. And as you know, he is indeed a esteemed authorities in regard to the basic science and, and uh, regulatory issues associated with uh, light and laser safeties. And today's title of his talk is to, uh, The Present Status of the Laser Safety. David, would you please Thank start? you. Good morning, everyone. I'm very honored and pleased to be here. And, uh, there are a lot of things that have been happening in the general field of laser safety recently, perhaps the most important relating to some changes coming for our exposure limits, our maximum uh, permissible exposure limits. Over the last decade, uh, we've seen a great uh, progress in uh, harmonization of laser product safety standards uh, worldwide. And uh, there were, for a period, there were light emitting diodes included in the scope of the laser safety standard and this created a lot of confusion and problems uh, and that has now been solved and we have separate uh, laser safety and lamp safety product standards. We've also seen an evolution of more vertical standards, that is standards that are application oriented, medical only safety standards, uh, uh, research and development only safety standards and so on. Uh, we also have seen great progress made in uh, the manufacturing of new laser uh, surgical and medical products that are safer to use, more system safety features, which permit the relaxation of some of the more stringent safety procedures that the user has to imply apply in the, in the operating room. We also have seen a wider application of lasers with quite a few new applications in diagnostic uh, applications, optical diagnostic, uh, fluorescence diagnostic, and so forth. But most of all that I would like to talk to about today is the uh, uh, changes of exposure limits. Now, we need to remember that there are basically two types of safety standards. Uh, one that applies to the uh, product and uh, the whole, all of the safety features try to enclose as much hazardous radiation as possible. Others have to do with safe use standards and occupational health and safety standards and there the uh, interest is on the individual who might be exposed and we have limiting uh, li limits to that exposure. Now there are a lot of effects of light as we all know and uh, this organization particularly has been pioneering and better understanding not only the higher power s uh, surgical implications of high power laser on tissue but also low level uh, light. And one of the areas that is quite interesting recently has been uh, quite a few breakthroughs in understanding the circadian biology and neuroendocrine effects of light uh, on the human body. Now there are different groups that are involved in establishing safety standards. On the uh, national levels there are normally groups that are 
concern with safe manufacture and others on safe exposure. On the international scene, we have the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, Protection ICNIRP, and, the, uh, and that uh, recommends exposure limits for humans, and the International Electrotechnical Commission, the IEC, which uh, follows those guidelines in developing their emission limits for their products. Now, another point to remember from a safety standpoint, the reason a laser is quite so dangerous is because of its very high radiance. It has very high brightness, which means it can be focused to a tiny spot. And that's precisely why it's so useful in surgery and in material processing and reading detailed information on a compact disc. And all of the applications that we see for lasers generally relate to this high radiance. But we don't normally talk about it, but it's an important thing to remember. If we take a conventional light source like an LED, we cannot focus it to such a small target, which means that, for example, for low-level laser therapy where you may not want to have such focal energy, it's perfectly fine and all the better than compared to a laser. So normally the thesis has been if you don't need a laser, don't use it. Try to use the qualities that make the laser uh, it, uh, quite special. There are different standards for lamps and LEDs compared to lasers for safety. And the reason is that lasers default situation, the basic limit, relate to this sort of point source worst case uh, viewing condition where the energy can be focused to a tiny spot creating very high irradiance at the retina compared to lamps which are extended sources and the radiance of the lamp is the basic limit. It took a decade for many of the engineers involved in the product safety standards to fully understand and recognize this distinction and why finally a few years ago we deleted the uh, LEDs from the scope of the lamp safety or the laser safety standard. So currently there's work being done to update the lamp safety standard to better treat LEDs. The lamp safety is also grouped into risk categories very much like lasers, like we have class one, two, three, four lasers. We have risk groups RG1, RG2, and RG3 for lamps. Since lamps can't achieve very high radiance, we don't really have a class four uh, a group in dealing with uh, lamps and LEDs. So, of course, most of our exposure limits relate to the eye. And uh, there are limits for the skin, but they're seldom applied. And recently people have complained that some class one eye safe products may actually be hazardous to the skin and we don't adequately deal with that. Actually, it is dealt with, but it's in uh, product safety standards. The, there are many different types of effects that can occur to the eye depending upon the wavelength and uh, how, concentrate, how concentrated the energy are, but these are some of the types of effects that I think most of us here are quite familiar with, from the ultraviolet to the uh, visible and infrared. And of course, depending upon the wavelength region, these hazards will dominate in the ultraviolet, others like retinal injury in the visible and the infrared, and only corneal burns when we reach the far infrared, requiring a great deal more energy. Now when we deal with uh, incoherent sources, lamps, we have to do a lot more math and processing of the data because of the varying wavelength effects, and many lamps other than LEDs have emissions in the ultraviolet, visible, and infrared altogether. There is a change underway in some of the limits that are expressed here. I won't go into any detail, but just to alert to you the fact that the safety limits for intense pulse lights and very large sources that are flash lamps uh, will actually be increased because they had been lowered in the 1990s to try to accommodate uh, laser safety standards, which were totally unrealistic for, for that. Now, it's well to remember that the area that is most sensitive 
for injury and also most critical for, for uh, vision, the fovea centralis, the center of the macula, is what we're particularly concerned about in laser safety. If somebody gets an accidental exposure out here in the periphery, it, it will have very little effect on vision compared to a situation where the person's looking straight at the reflection. There have been questions raised about lower power lasers and particularly with the increased use of uh, gallium nitride lasers and gallium nitride LEDs down around 405 nanometers uh, and the question about the so-called blue light hazard. And I just wanted to uh, mention this uh, in a passing. Uh, this is the one type of injury that from the sun or arc lamps we can see in individuals. It's pretty rare because somebody has to stare at a very bright source for some time. But if, for example, they think it's okay and they force themselves to overcome their natural aversion to bright light and stare at a blue source, they can have an unfortunate uh, injury. This is a tiny, tiny lesion here, but it's right in the fovea, so this person suffered uh, a loss of uh, vision uh, right in that little spot. But it's, it's quite a rare problem because n most people don't want to stare at a bright light source. The aversion response, the movement of the head, the re constriction of the pupil, and movement of the eye all limit the risk from laser pointers and from uh, small source lasers like, like a, a diode laser used for uh, low level light therapy. And the reason is not just the aversion response, but also we have eye movements. The tiny image of a laser on the retina might be only 20 micrometers in diameter, like this little spire here. Within just one second, though, the end, because of eye movements that are essential to vision, this spot wavers around a much larger spot, making that exposure safer than you might otherwise think. And after 100 seconds, even if you fixate and try to stabilize your eye, that tiny image will be uh, blurred over an enormously larger area, therefore reducing the risk. And for this reason, although people have been concerned about laser pointer uh, exposures, the, the likelihood that one could have an injury from a laser pointer is very, very low. In fact, the few cases that are documented with retinal injury from say five, 10 milliwatts power were where the person forced themselves to stare at it for several seconds. Now an, another story that I think is quite interesting to those of us who um, employ statistics is how one has have to be very cautious in interpreting uh, statistical treatments of, of data. And what this relates to is the fact that for 20, 30 years, we've had a reduction factor, an added uh, limit uh, placed upon all multiple pulsed exposures. And it also added a great deal of complexity in performing a risk assessment from uh, repetitively pulsed lasers. About 15 years ago, a uh, young physicist uh, in San Antonio uh, suggested that this um, additivity of multiple pulses was in fact n not based in real science but was purely the result of how we uh, statistically treated the probability of seeing a tiny lesion. And at the time most of us disregarded and said it's an interesting thing but didn't think of it. Too, uh, too much. But we should have known because we need to realize why we were using statistics to try to detect the threshold for seeing a minimum visible lesion. That is when a laser beam is focused to a tiny spot on the retina, it's very difficult to see uh, a lesion. And as a result, back in the early 1970s when we settled on the exposure limits we have now for intra-beam viewing, uh, 